This morning I'd like for us to focus on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Arguably the most important event that has taken place in all of Christendom is his resurrection. This morning as we speak, we're also going to be vicariously witnessing the baptism of Luna Fick. She is Sandra Cortabaria's granddaughter. I was studying with her the gospel over Zoom. And in our discussion, one of the things we asked was, what is the most important thing of human life? And what is what people fear the most? Beside all the other fears that humankind has, one of the greatest fears is the fear of death. But one of the greatest blessings is that Christ would tell humankind is that death is not the final story, not the final chapter of human life. Two people were baptized into Christ this week, and I know they are watching on, Zoom, on YouTube this morning. It's Michelle and her mom. And it was such a wonderful day for all of us who knew them and know them, as there was a process over a period of time for them to fully understand and grasp and commit. Death is arguably one of the most difficult things to overcome. 2013, sorry, in 2021, the 14th of August, a gentleman, a pastor here in Johannesburg, died. He was taken to a funeral home and um, he stayed there until a few weeks ago. His family refused to have him buried because his wife had a vision that her husband was going to be raised from the dead. And so for two years, he stayed in a funeral home in their care facility. And eventually, by court order, they instructed the family to dispose of his remains. It's interesting that the same church who had such strong faith and ultimately had to bury this gentleman was also a group of people who believes that you can come to the miracle center and lose weight instantly. And so it's a kind of interesting dynamic that we find that folk believe and has a different view of what the resurrection actually is. This morning, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. If you ask any child they would, and say to them, what does Easter mean to you? More than likely, the child would say to you, well, um, Easter eggs and Easter bunnies and everything is just great. And it's a wonderful, wonderful theme of chocolates and sweeties. And some children will say to you, well, it means something different to me. Although many children will have different takes on what an Easter actually is. But Jesus Christ, through Paul, would write for us and say that the resurrection of Jesus is so crucial that if, we, if it did not happen, then we are to be pitied the most. Because, like he says, we've lied about him, we've believed the lie, and we are deluded. It's interesting that Jesus Christ would have been buried on the Friday evening and Sunday morning his tomb was empty. And this is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ that speaks of the death, burial and resurrection of Christ. The ultimate victory over death. And here it is that thousands of people would have been crucified. Not one made it out beyond the grave. But Jesus did. There was a wonderful story of Nikita Khrushchev who was died and he was a Soviet Union leader. And he, he, he asked if he could be buried in Israel. Golda Meir made a comment and said, I need to warn you. 
that our country has the highest rate of resurrection. And so Jesus Christ, even though just by jest, still to this day is known for the resurrection of Christ. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 it's a passage that I have read more times than I care to remember. But Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says the following. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, immediately we will say to each other that that is not a formula for salvation. And it definitely is not. But what it is is an attestation of a fundamental truth. You see, Paul did not say, if you want to be saved, you need to believe in the virgin birth. Paul was not saying that if you want to be saved, that you must believe that Jesus Christ walked on water and healed the sick. What he said was, you need to understand one thing. And base your entire life on that, that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. About 160 people die daily in the world. People go into eternity prepared or unprepared to meet God. And here again, this week, we felt the bitter pull of death, even in our own extended family. Where a mother found a child after a week looking for him. It's always sad. The loss of pain, of separation, is always severe. In fact, the entire Reality and surety of death is so secure that an entire industry has been birthed around it. And so we have funeral homes and life insurances. But you cannot buy life insurance to try and dodge it. You can only buy life insurance so that it benefits those whom we leave behind. Sue and I watch Itchy Boots. I'm not quite sure if you do too. And it's of a wonderful Netherland lady that travels all over the world and she sees fascinating places. Amazing person and kind. I've not heard her swear once. And she travels all over the world alone. And she, as she goes, she learns the language and she uh, in, interacts with different cultural groups in different settings. And it is absolutely fascinating. I heard a story many years ago, and it still stays with me, about a wealthy merchant who was in the marketplace buying some provision for his master. The servant eventually was very scared, and he had a frightful experience. And as he was standing in the, mar in the market, the servant jumped up and he ran to his master, and he said to him, I can't believe what just happened. He says, what's wrong? He says, Master, while I was in the marketplace, I saw death and he saw me. He raised his arm to strike me. I'm certain he's here to take me. Please loan me your fastest horse so I can get away. The merchant says, where will you go? And he says, I will go to Samara, which, by the way, is in Iran. Death will never find me there. And so the merchant gave his servant his fastest horse and the servant rode swiftly off to the city of Samara, where he hoped to hide from death. The merchant then went to the marketplace, and while he was there, he also saw death. And he says, why did you raise your hand to strike my servant? And death says, actually, I meant him no harm. Raising my hand was a gesture of surprise. You see, I didn't expect to see him here in Baghdad. I expected to see him in Samara. Because I've got an appointment with him tonight. And so you see, it is the idea that sometimes we try to run away from death. But the Bible tells us through the book of Hebrews, that Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27, he says, it's appointed and destined for all men to die once. And the idea is that death is one of those things that has creeped in through sin. You see, God spoke to Adam and Eve and he said to them, do not eat of the fruit of the tree in the center of the garden, or if you do, you will die. It's still true today. Paul would write and acknowledge the reality of death. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, he says in verse 9 through to 10, he says, God has saved us and called us to a holy place. Not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and his grace. The grace was given to us in Jesus Christ 
before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. I want you to know that there's a wonderful phrase in that text. Christ has destroyed death. Some translations said it is abolished death. But there's one problem with that. Death doesn't seem to have been destroyed or abolished. You see, there are still undertakers in this world. People still die daily of illnesses. Cemeteries are still filling up daily. People are still dying of various ailments and illnesses. Some of them suddenly, some of them over periods of time. You just need to pick up the newspaper. But there's a Greek word there that is quite interesting to maybe delve into. The Greek word actually means he's taken the power away. And that's a different way of looking at it. But an important way of looking at it, because death is a reality, the power of death has been denuded. It's been taken away. He's broken the power of death. And so the crucifixion of Christ is far more significant than just some cat that has gotten up from the dead. It's that Jesus Christ has taken our greatest fear, our greatest pain, a source of pain, and he said, I will show you that you will not have the power over my children. The same word is used in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, where Paul says, our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with. And when we are baptized into Christ, A former body that used to sin was done away with. It wasn't destroyed. It wasn't abolished. But it no longer has the power over us to keep us away from Christ. Because now we live for him. Jesus didn't do away with death. But he took the power and the effect and the hold that it has over humanity. And said, I have the final word on this, not you. There are two ways that Jesus did this. He shows it in the first place that death does not have the final word. Romans 6, 9, he says, We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. In other words, Jesus Christ would prove even in the life of Lazarus. He would prove to them that I am the resurrection and the life. He walked into a situation that was helpless and hopeless. He was blamed for taking too long. People were upset. His family was distraught when he arrived. But Jesus broke the power of death. And Paul tells us that the story is not over yet. That 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And until then, death will take up new meaning for us. That we deal with death as par for the course. But it certainly doesn't captivate and capture our hearts into hopeless and helplessness. We still have to go through death. But Jesus has taken away the finality of death. In the second place, Jesus shows us that death is nothing to be afraid of. It is something that you don't need to cower or run away from. You see, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 to 15 says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. It is interesting to note that no matter who you come across, But you come across a Christian that views his or her life very differently. That fear of dying is not there. And I'm not saying it's an unscrupulous, irresponsible walking into a situation where you could possibly lose your life. But then whenever it does happen, you are not filled with fear and trepidation. Because there is something beyond the grave. A Russian writer, Dostoevsky... He wrote it down perfectly when he was about 27 years old. He was sentenced to death in Russia. And he stood before a firing squad. 
And he made a comment that just as he was firing a firing squad, he was then remitted. And he wrote these words down and he said something that I think you need to take note of. He said, the certainty of inescapable death and the uncertainty of what is to follow are the most dreadful anguish in the world. You see, it's not so much how you die or when you die, but what lies after this. That fills people with such anguish. The uncertainty of what is to follow. And that is what Christianity is all about. You will watch in the world that they will never take the mickey out of Judaism. They certainly won't dare take it out on Islam. They will certainly not take it out of Hinduism or Buddhism. But watch how they play with Christianity. And there is one thing that they have to destroy in humanity. Is this hope of eternal life. Because every other faith. Every other faith. Without any exclusion. Not, does not offer once or in any shape or form. The kind of hope that is led by a redeemer. Jesus Christ. Not one. What changes our life and our perspective on death. Is in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, where Paul writes, he says, O oh death, where's your sting? O oh grave, where's your victory? You see, what it means is that when this final chapter is written by Christ, he'll make a laughing stock of that which you and I feared so much. But what does that mean for us? What does it mean for me now? How does it affect the way that I do life? How does it affect the way that I interact and I go about my daily challenges? How do I react when I'm ill and I'm facing this very difficult reality that my body is giving in? Or the body of my loved ones are giving in? The first one, I want to make two suggestions of two. One of two. It means that we have hope. For the life to come. In the book of Job. Job asks a very cardinal question. That has plagued humanity. At its earliest. He asks the question in Job chapter 14. 14. And says if a man dies. Will he live again? And that is a cardinal question. We all battle with. We all inquire about. We all wonder. If that is the case. What form will it take? What will it look like? And we are given tremendous amount of information, especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he talks about the glorified body when it is sown in corruption and incorruptibility comes out. He speaks about changing the body in a moment's flash. And so we start to have glimpses of what this might look look like. But because it is outside of our frame of physical reference, we can only spiritually perceive what that reality would look like. There's a wonderful story spoken about Dr. Einstein. And he was sitting on a train one day, traveling to wherever he was. And the conductor came to him and said to him, Dr. Einstein, good morning, sir, how are you? Can I have your ticket, please? And he said, sure, no problem. And he reached into his pocket And he couldn't find his ticket. And he looked everywhere. He got at his wallet. He looked for it. And he was looking on the seat. And and the ticket conductor said to him, don't stress. Don't worry about it. I know you, Dr. Einstein, that you would have paid for your ticket. And Einstein just ignored him. And he carried on looking around for his ticket. And he, he was on his hands and knees under the seat. And he's looking in his pocket, turning out his pockets. His shirt pocket. And eventually was so uncomfortable And the guy said to him, Dr. Einstein, please, don't worry about it. Sit down and relax and enjoy the journey. And he said, the reason I'm trying to find my ticket is I need to know where I'm going. (laughs) You see, sometimes we don't know where we're going. We don't know where this thing's going to end up. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ provides for us. You see, 
In life, we primarily learn from good and bad experiences. You see, but one of the things that happens is death only occurs once. You can't do it again. But what Jesus Christ did would tell us that the finality of death is not the final story. There's a whole world beyond that. Jesus took out the finality of death. In other words, death did not write the final chapter on human life. I love the way that whenever we lose a loved one or a parent or a sibling or a friend, we see death as the end of existence. And some people will say that you're going to soul sleep or they'll come up with various theories. But the reality in Christ is that when someone has died, we must see it differently. Rather that death is not the destroyer of human life, but the rearranger of human life. And reviewing it in a different way that says that, hang on a minute, isn't there something cryptic that lies in John chapter 3 when Jesus talks about the waters of rebirth? If you and I think of a mother having a baby inside of her, that is the child's life. It is the, where the child is nurtured and that is his, his comfort zone. That's where he or she can hear the, the, the heartbeat of his mom. And that's where he lies and, and exists. And then birth takes place. The pain of childbirth, spoken of also in the book of Romans. Where the process and trauma of that child entering into this world. And the first thing the child does, it screams. Obviously taking its first breath. Because all those have been provided by the umbilical cord attached to the mom. But maybe for the child, it is traumatic. It is fearful. It is scary. It's the end of something. It's the end of my life. I don't want to leave the womb. But it's not really the end of the life. It's the start of a new beginning. And that's exactly what death is. Is that sometimes you leave this world kicking and screaming. And as you are torn away from this world... You want to stay behind because it's all that you know. It's all that you are familiar with. But what happens is afterward, we start to learn how to, how to walk. We learn how to talk. We learn how to run. We learn how to adapt to this beautiful world that God had created for us. And though we find that inside of there are so many challenges that gives us so much disruption and trauma... This existence, although it at times are traumatic and we'd like to get out of it, we are still only familiar with this. And it becomes home. And so at the experience of death, we say, oh my word, I don't want to leave this because it's all I know. And yet God says to you in the same way as a child is born into this world, that it is a new beginning. A new beginning where you leave behind all those things that could have hurt you. Paul would say, that being absent from you is being present with the Lord. Philippians 1.23, he says, To depart, and it is better for me, uh, to be with Christ is far better. But he also says, to be with you, I can be more profitable in my labor. Hermann Langer, a German, officer, a German preacher, wrote this letter to his, his mother. He spoke out against Hitler. And Langer was arrested and he was interrogated and tried as a criminal, and he was condemned to be killed. And as a preacher, he knew that he'd made a choice that was irreversible. Hammond Langer wrote this to his parents. When this letter comes to your hands, I shall no longer be among the living. The thing that has occupied our thoughts constantly for many months is now about to happen. If you ask me what state I am in, I can only answer... I am first in a joyous mood and second filled with great anticipation. As regards to the first feeling of joy, today means the end of all suffering and all earthly sorrow for me. God will wipe away every tear from my eyes. And as to the second feeling of anticipation, this day brings the greatest hour of my life. Everything till now I have done, struggled for and accomplished has been directed toward this goal, this one goal. For me, believing will become seeing. 
Hope will become possession, and I shall forever share in him who is love. <coughs> Should I not then be filled with anticipation? Today is the great day on which I return to the home of my father. How could I fail to be excited and full of anticipation? You see, revisioning such a terrifying thing is the way that Christians view life. In the second way, death has got a way of helping us in the resurrection of Christ is to find meaning in this life. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to make a difference in this world? Let me ask you another question. Why? You see, let me say this to you. Not everybody does. Not everybody makes a difference in this world. You see, sometimes you just become satisfied with life. You've got a good job, you've got a good wife, a couple of good kids, nice car, long weekends away with some good friends, partying, being able to ignore life and just get away from things. And that's pretty much all that you want out of life. And some people literally want to live a life that they say, I want to be, uh, just, just get on with my own thing. You see, there is far more things to life. Sometimes we want to make good money so that I can spend them on things that are useless. Things that I will throw away eventually or just hand down to somebody that needs it. Is that really what you want to do with your life? John Piper makes a comment and I've listened to a story of his. He was telling a story of Ruby and Laura. These two women lived in Cameroon, West Africa. Ruby was 80 years old. She'd been single all her life and spent her life sharing Jesus Christ with the unreached, the poor and the sick. Laura was a wid widow. She was a medical doctor and she was well into her 80s. And she served with Ruby in Cameroon. And one day in April 2000, the brakes of their car failed and their car went off a cliff. Both of them died instantly. Piper raises the question, was that a tragedy? Two lives driven by one great passion, namely to be spent in unheralded service to the perishing poor for the glory of God. And even two de decades after most of the American counterparts had retired to throw away their lives on trifles. And his answer is no, this is not a tragedy, that is glory. And then John Piper goes on to say, let me tell you what tragedy is. And he reads from the Reader's Digest. And he says, Bob and Penny took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast five years ago when he was 59 and she was 51. And now they live in Florida where they cruise in their 30 foot yacht, playing baseball and collecting shells. That's the American dream. Come to the end of your life, your one and only precious God given life. And that's the last great work of your life before you give an account to your Creator. Be this playing softball and collecting shells. That's the tragedy. Piper says that's the tragedy. And people today are spending billions of dollars to persuade you to embrace the tragic dream. The American dream in so many ways is an empty dream. It's a dream, dream built in consumerism that has captured the hearts of so many of us. Why? Because advertising spends billions of dollars worldwide. So that you and I can buy into that kind of the, uh, thinking. We've bought into a self-serving, arrogant lifestyle. You see... Sometimes you look at someone that is entering into full-time ministry. What a waste of your life. You know, you could be making money. You could be doing this. You could be doing that. But let me say this to you. What makes a big difference is that when you invest your life in keeping people and populating heaven, that is a good life. Sometimes we go to work and all we want to do is just punch the card and, and get on with life and so I can go home and, and do my own thing. What about your mission that you've been called to? To herald the, 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 the risen Christ. Revisioning the idea that Christ has died so that you and I can live. 
that this world is not our home, that you and I are just passing through this world, and that rather that your, your earnings and your life and your work and your career is not an end, but a means to an end to serve God. It's the way that people sometimes misunderstand what life's about. And so we invest our life in things that makes us feel good. Rather than leaving behind a legacy that the world will know that you've been there. Not because of self-serving things to have your name put in lights or memorialized in any shape or form. But that your and my name will be written in the book of life. And that ultimately when you stand before a holy God, you can say, I have not spent my life. I've invested my life in a kingdom of God that is eternal. That will never perish, spoil or fade. And that everything that I have, I've submitted to that one purpose. And one goal and one thing only. And that's to glorify God. You see, brethren, you often look at people that do that. And you think they are nuts. And you look at folk that sits around and, 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 and gathers all this stuff for themselves and, and, and spends money on these wonderful uh, cruises and, and stuff like that. And I'm certainly not jealous. I promise you. But I can say this to you. The question on the table is going to be, when you stand before a holy God and he asks you, what have you done with what I've given you? What will your answer be? Listen to Paul's words again. First Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. God saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. The grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior. Christ Jesus, who's destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. I want to encourage you today. That the resurrection of Christ. Will forever. Review and revision your life. And when you look at those who have passed away. And will be passing on. I want you to look at their life differently. That it is not a destruction of life. But a rearranging of true life. Only found in Jesus Christ. That is why when we baptize someone into Christ, it is the most amazing witness, again, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I was privileged to baptize a wonderful friend of mine's mom. She was 87 years old. She is 87. And I've always, always loved Ivona. She was a nursing sister all her life. And now her hearing is going and She's also struggling a little bit with her health. But one of the things is for sure that she serves God. She's a wonderful person. I want to point out somebody else and you might not know her. You often don't see her. Dorothy Borsoff. Let me just say this to you. Of all the funerals and burials that I've done, the one I will remember for the rest of my life is the one of a woman that she took into her home. June Lachrancy. And you know what? We stood alone, myself and Dorothy Borsoff and, Dor and June Lachrancy's sister in law. And as the three of us were standing there, we then called all the grave diggers to come. I remember it was a Friday afternoon, late afternoon. And Dorothy Borsoff told me that June requested that she be buried in the same hole as her mother. They placed her coffin on there and we spoke about this. And as I spoke to those men, I said, this story is not over. The story is not over. That woman, that coffin you see there, June Lachrancy will rise again. Dorothy nursed her till the day that she passed away. She took her out of a retirement village into her home. You see, you might not know those things. I do. And she nursed her and as she took care of June. 
Lachrancy, till the day that she passed on. Let me say this to you this morning. What does life mean to you today? What does it mean? Going to graph and working and doing your thing, coming home, sitting in front of the television with a cup of tea and saying, whew, what a lovely day. And then doing the same thing tomorrow and the same thing tomorrow. And when you ask the question, have I touched the life of someone? Isn't that what you're here for? Isn't that what we are here for together? Maybe today I want to encourage you that if you have not embraced Christ and been baptized into Christ, maybe you're living a life completely derailed from the intents and purposes of God, that you will come today. Let's pray with you. If you need to be baptized, let's baptize you into Christ today. There is no such thing as tomorrow. We only live for now. Tomorrow is a figment of your imagination. Yesterday is but a memory. Let's stand and sing our closing song for this morning.